um, how do church leaders like you keep their perspective and engage with social needs, moral needs, political needs, while avoiding being drawn into those power games you spoke of? I think in every positive thing, you can fall into a negative trap. I think those are some of the dangers that are there and are real. But I would hate to be a politician, so that helps me a lot. I've, I've watched our presidents, I've watched uh, people in leadership, I've been involved in many initiatives with our cabinet ministers on the basis of our children, on the basis now we're going to go into initiative with the police across the country. They, uh, we're going to partnership with that. But I tell you, I don't, I would, don't want to be a politician. I just want to influence people that are in leadership and to work with them to make a difference. Back in 2009, um, you did raise some eyebrows in South Africa politically when you invited then presidential candidate Jacob Zuma to speak at a Sunday morning meeting. Um, that led, in some quarters, to accusations of political bias. Why do you feel that having candidates speak in church might sometimes be a good idea, and what, if any, conditions do you set before you allow it? Well, I think in the context of my situation at the time, uh, we, we, we had invited then the deputy president wasn't the president, Jacob Zuma to our church, and, and, uh, but it didn't work out. So we, we, we uh, postponed him coming to the church, and it was over about a year we couldn't get anything done. Then he went through uh, some of the issues that are still issues today, and I got a phone call from one of our uh, members of our church who's very close to me, an elder in the church, and said he'd been speaking to him and he really would like to come. And at that time it wasn't popular to invite him to come, but I said, okay, let him come. When he came, I got him to just uh, address the congregation, but not politically, not in any way about different issues, just talking about, he spoke for a few minutes about the role of the church in the ANC from when they were founded and who founded it and how it was founded on the basis of some priests and definitely for a couple of minutes. Well, it looked like all hell broke loose, but the one important factor for me was that when I gave the altar call, he came forward. Now, many people will argue whether any president is saved or not saved or whatever. That can be debatable all day long. But it was interesting to me that I sat with him afterwards, went through certain things, and through that developed the relationship that when he became president, I was one of the first ports of call that he made. And since then, I've been seeing him on a regular basis. Now, you can't go and change the country through an hour once every six weeks. You can't go and tell people how to run things. I've just been there to spiritually pray with him and, and, and minister to him. But the interesting thing was, a, a church group had booked our church for an evangelistic missions seminar. And they cancelled coming here because I had him and he came forward. So I thought, <laughs> how surreal is that, that we're persecuted because he came forward and he came to the church. Now, uh, I thought, surely if you're going to do an evangelistic missions outreach, you're trying to get everybody that you can to at least pray with you the sinner's prayer. So it was quite funny. I, I, I actually never forgot that. Yes, maybe God does have a sense of humor. At uh, 2020 Plus in London, we're, we're constantly researching future change and the impact of new generations on that change. And all the studies we're seeing suggest that the emerging young generations, especially the ones we now call Generation Edge, those under 17, may become more politically aware and engaged than previous generations were, though they probably express it in different ways. I think through... that's, that's vitally important, Mel, because I'll tell you why that I don't think we've thought through the practical steps to actually accomplish certain things. So I would say one to those young people that send a representative to everything that is taking place in their community. Send, a, send somebody that has read, understands, and has some knowledge about what that meeting's about. Then thirdly, to volunteer to be involved. 
You might get persecuted from some people that have a subculture that believe the church needs to isolate themselves. But how can you become relevant in a community if you're not part of the solution to the community? And I found that if you start doing that a lot more and you get involved actively and you actually study out and work through things that are taking place to understand the different viewpoints and what different people are coming from, I mean, that's vitally important. But we like to stay naive. And then we can't understand why nobody gives us any credibility. We must probably the best kept secret on the planet right now, the church. And just a couple more questions, Pastor Ray. What would you like to see the next generation of Christian leaders achieve in the social and political arenas that you haven't been able to? I think that if we don't become um, uh, m m of much more influence, we're going to have a serious problem. That uh, what happens in the end is that darkness overtakes light if you don't be the light. And I think that in the next decades, we need to become very relevant in our communities and address very, very important issues. I'll give you one silly example that happened nearly 30 years ago was I then, after I had this Damascus encounter, I realized that many of our white membership had domestic workers working on a Sunday and they couldn't come to church. So I challenged our church to give the transport to bring them with them to come to the church and they as Christians, the domestic worker has every right to be part of a local church and involved in the church. Well, I had maybe 200 people walk out and leave. But as they started to do that, it started to get them to a place where there was some form of communication, respect. Then I moved our church into the home groups in the areas where the black people were living at the time and got them to stay overnight with them. Well, when they came back the next day, they had a totally different perspective of what's going on. These are the type of initiatives that we ignore. And we, we, we really believe that just to meet a person's need is to lay hands and pray on them or let them pray the sinner's prayer. That's not going to change the world. It's going to make heaven populated, which I'm for. I'm a soul winner. I love people, and I love to populate heaven and plunder hell, as Ryan always says. But we need to understand that for us to become what the church should be, there's much more to it than just that.